History as it happens, March 21st, 2024. Debs. The world of socialist movement is to win from capitalism. We'll be filled with wealth for all to have and to enjoy in its abundance. That the working class who fight all the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish the corpses have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. Yes, it is possible to run for president from prison. Eugene V. Debs tried it in 1920, his so-called front cell campaign. Debs' name's been coming up because of the possible parallel to Donald Trump, who's facing a slew of criminal charges that could land him in prison at some point. But that's where the similarities end. Michael Kazin joins us next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. Well, actually, there was a pretty large movement after the war ended to commute the sentences of people like Debs who had uh, gone to jail under the Espionage Act, which actually the, the original act, the Sedition Act was passed a year later, it made it even tougher. But there was a cross section of some Democrats and Republicans uh, supported commuting Debs' sentence and those of others. And also the war was over and of course he'd been put in jail uh, in a law passed by Democrats and signed by Democratic President Woodrow Wilson and Harding had won a landslide against the Democrats in 1920. So it was a way for Harding to sort of uh, you know, hand out an olive branch, I think, to people to his left. At a campaign rally in Ohio, Donald Trump said a number of things that have been making headlines for days now. He talked about a bloodbath if he doesn't win in November. But as defenders pointed out, he was referring to the American auto industry, which needs protection from Chinese imports. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, We're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath. The rally began with the announcer praising the January 6 hostages, the rioters who tried to stop the certification of the election. Please rise for the horribly and unfairly treated January 6 hostages. Trump also referred to immigrants in colorful language. These are bad. These are animals, okay? And we have to stop it. And there, Trump was referring to prison inmates in other countries who he says are being sent here to cause crime. Whatever you think of Trump's words in Ohio, what he said wasn't illegal. 106 years ago, an anti-war speech by Eugene Debs in Canton, Ohio, violated the Espionage Act. Debs was convicted and sentenced to prison. And in 1920, he ran for president as the socialist candidate from his cell. So what did he say in that speech that got him in so much trouble? See if you can recognize this voice. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose, while the subject class has had nothing to gain and all to lose especially their lives. Yep, that is Brooklyn-born Bernie Sanders in 1979, reading Debs's Canton speech condemning the war and the draft. For an audio documentary Sanders wrote and produced, Eugene V. Debs, trade unionist, socialist, and revolutionary, 1855 to 1926. For Folkways Records, yes, you would play that on a record player. Unfortunately, no recording of Debs' voice exists. If anyone ever recorded one of his rousing speeches, it has been lost to history. The closest thing we have is this from the Michigan State University Voice Library, circa 1904. The actor Leonard Spencer is the voice, narrating one of Debs' denunciations of capitalism. The middle class be their doom in capitalism, and must soon turn to socialism. The handwriting is on all the billboards of the universe. So, why a podcast about Debs, a dead socialist? Well, as I mentioned at the top, I've seen his name come up here and there because Donald Trump could, although it appears very unlikely, be imprisoned one day as he faces dozens of criminal charges in a number of cases. I wouldn't bet on it, but a conviction would not stop Trump, or anyone else for that matter, from running for president, as Debs did in 1920. 
It was his fifth time running for the White House under the socialist banner. He received more than 900,000 votes. No electoral college votes. He didn't carry any states. Republican Warren G. Harding won a landslide over Democrat James Cox. 16 million votes to Cox's 9 million, 404 to 127 in the electoral college in the election of 1920. Debs' five failed presidential campaigns are not the best reason to remember him. His ideas were more important. After all, his ideas were what got him into trouble. He denounced American involvement in World War I because workers of the world are not supposed to kill each other. Debs attacked capitalism, but some of what he stood for may not sound too radical to some of you today, as we'll discuss with our guest in a moment. So Donald Trump is making himself out to be a victim of political persecution and says President Biden is a threat to our democracy. And remember this, remember this, Joe Biden is a great threat to our democracy. He's a tremendous threat to our democracy. His incompetence is the number one reason. Well, if that charge sounds familiar, it's because Trump's opponents have been making it against him for years now. And the way his critics describe Trumpism squares with our usual way of understanding democracy in this country as the best system to protect political and civil rights, civil liberties. Debs, as a union organizer and then a socialist politician, focused on economic rights as vital to democracy, the kind of issues Bernie Sanders campaigned on back in 2015. We must not accept a nation in which billionaires compete as to the size of their super yachts while children in America go hungry and veterans, men and women who have put their lives on the line to defend us, sleep out on the streets. The notion that we, the people, are entitled to economic rights does not seem to be as universally embraced as, say, voting rights. You know, every American citizen over 18 has a right to vote. But do you have a right to earn a certain wage or own a home or have health insurance? Michael Kazin is a distinguished historian of political and social movements at Georgetown University. That happens to be where Bernie Sanders gave that speech in 2015. And he is the author of, most recently, What It Took to Win, The History of the Democratic Party. Hello, Michael Kazin. Good to talk to you again. Always great to be here. So, you know, Eugene V. Debs, there really isn't a lot in common between him and Donald Trump. But, you know, his name does come up. Uh, these days because he ran for president from prison, proving once again that what I've been saying all along, Michael Kazin, there is nothing in U.S. politics that is truly unprecedented. Uh, How did he wind up in prison? Congress in 1917, soon after the U.S. entered World War I, passed a law called the Espionage Act, which in rather vague terms said it was a felony to impede the operation of the draft or uh, the armed forces in any way. Debs gave a speech uh, more than a year later, in July uh, 1918, actually at a Socialist Party picnic in Canton, Ohio, better known as the uh, hometown of uh, William McKinley and where the NFL Hall of Fame is, in which he basically opposed the draft. I can read you a a little piece of that speech uh, very quickly. Yeah, don't read Um, the entire speech. We'll be here all day. (laughs) No, don't worry. He said, uh, the working class has never yet had a voice in declaring war. Workers were taught it was a patriotic duty to have yourself slaughtered at command. So he clearly was opposing the draft, uh, which had been opposed in 1917 for the first time uh, since the Civil War. So there were people from the Justice Department had been hounding him for a while since the war had begun. And they thought this speech, uh, which clearly said the draft was a very bad thing for working people, was enough to get him charged. And so he was charged with this violation of the Espionage Act. He had a trial, and he was uh, given a 10-year sentence, which he served uh, only three years of, actually, most of it in federal penitentiary in Atlanta. But during those three years, the 1920 election took place, and he was a Socialist Party's candidate for that election, as he had been four other times in the 20th century. Yeah, if there's a parallel here, it is that it is possible to run for president from prison, that being convicted of a crime does not disqualify you, I guess. Nothing in the Constitution says you can't run from prison. That's yeah. true. I don't think Donald Trump's going to be in prison. I mean, who knows for sure, but I doubt it. I mean, I don't no, know. No, the trials, the trials will not conclude. It looks like at least no criminal trial will conclude before. So, you know, uh, you used to be, then. as you've discussed on this show, 
Sorry to cut you off there, but you used to be an anti-war protester during the 1960s. That really wasn't Deb's profession. He was a socialist. He was politically involved. He was a union organizer. He was a union man. But as any good socialist would do, he opposed the war because workers from different countries are not supposed to kill each other on the fields of battle. Uh, you, you quoted a little bit of the speech. It is a very long speech. I read it before connecting with you here over Zoom. And that's, of course, uh, typical of those days. People gave long speeches. But he said, and I quote, Here, let me emphasize the fact, and it cannot be repeated too often, the working class who fight all the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish the corpses, etc. Yours not to reason why, yours but to do and die. That is their motto, and we object on the part of the awakening workers of this nation. That is their motto. He was talking about the ruling class, right? Yeah, his motto was uh, no war but class war. And, you know, the Bolsheviks had taken power the fall before that in October uh, 1917, actually November by our calendar. So he was supportive of the Bolsheviks at that time. He turned against them later on. So the left in the United States was completely opposed to the war. There were some pro-war socialists, but they're a very small minority, as opposed to socialists in Europe, uh, most of whom had supported their country going to war because they felt it was a defensive war against foreign powers uh, uh, trying to invade them on all sides. But nobody could be convinced that the United States was in serious danger of being invaded by, by the Germans. That's right. He does talk about Prussianism in his speech. He says, you know, we're not on the side of the Prussians here. He just thought that the United States should not be involved in a war between rapacious capitalist powers. So, you know, it is, and we've discussed this in the past, it is easy to romanticize radicals from the past. And I do think Debs had some some worthwhile things to say in this very long speech. I mean, I oppose war myself. But his analysis of the causes of the war or the dimensions of the war, I mean, I don't know what you think of this, but he saw it as a, like the way Lenin saw it, as a battle between capitalist powers trampling the working class of the world. Well, I wrote a whole book about the anti-war movement in the United States, as you, as you know, called War Against War, the American Fight for Peace, 1914-1918. And you know, there I, I have a you know more <laughs> nuanced, perhaps, a complex yes. analysis uh, of the war. It was a war certainly among imperial powers. I mean, that's certainly true. Britain, France, Russia, Germany, Austria-Hungary were all empires. The United States as well, colony in the Philippines and virtual colonies in Puerto Rico and other places. It was also a war of nationalisms, competing nationalisms. And to a certain degree, one of the reasons most Americans supported the war, I think, was it was a war by more democratic nations, uh, at least at home, U.S., France, Britain, against the less democratic nation of Germany, and to a degree, the Ottoman Empire, centered in Turkey yeah. as well. So it was, it was more complicated. You know, but back then, most people in the anti-war movement, not just, not just Debs, not just socialists, believed this was about capital. It was about greed. Weapons manufacturers but, making money. Yeah, it, wasn't just so, it wasn't just socialists who opposed the war. And also, it was unusual back then, you know, remember, this was the first war first overseas war in which the U.S. had fought. So it was a pretty unprecedented war. And so a lot of Americans just thought, what business do we have over yeah. there working for one empire opposed to another empire? Yeah, I met you when you gave a public lecture in D.C. about opposition to World War I. Uh, the most famous song of that time was uh, I didn't was it? I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. What was the name of it? You got it. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. You that's know, right. Which is a song sung by mothers. That's At least right. that's the idea. Even though it's written by a man. Mother murmured through her tears. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Mother murmured through her tears. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. And joy. Who dared to play the musket on his sword? Well, just to tell you how indifferent or opposed the American public was to getting involved in this European war and sending our boys over there, over there, the government had to pass something like the Sedition Act to punish dissent. They had to manufacture consent for the war. The, the Wilson administration actually had a propaganda office. They didn't call it that, but they hired an advertising executive to run it, didn't they? Yeah, Committee on Public Information, it was called. A very nice, anodyne, yes. <laughs> neutral-sounding word. No, it was two sides. I mean, on the one hand, they had this sort of uh, selling apparatus, uh, the CPI, which which hired what they call four-minute men to give quick speeches, not long speeches, but quick speeches in support of the war in factories and communities to citizen groups and different languages as well, because, of course, America was a heavily immigrant country in many ways at the time. 
And the other side was, as you mentioned, the Justice Department, uh, the Bureau of Investigation, military intelligence, cracked down on dissent in a way really had never happened before in American history. Uh, it was the most ferocious assault on civil liberties in American history. There was a Red Scare around this time as well, right? Yeah. I mean, that was it was a Red Scare partly opposed to people like Debs, who, yes. who opposed the war. And then once the Bolshevik Revolution takes place and you have a new Communist Party, which is formed right after World War One is over... Then you have this famous Palmer raids. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover gets his start fingering pro-Bolshevik Americans and getting some of them, like Emma Goldman, the famous anarchist, deported back to Russia. Uh, Adam Hochschild, my friend Adam Hochschild, has a very good book, came out, I think, last year, called American Midnight, which is a nice uh, way to understand this period. He wrote a book about the, the battles in World War I. That was very good. I read that some years ago. But there was also anarchist violence uh, during this time. In fact, Ebbs makes reference to Tom Mooney, who was uh, falsely accused, falsely convicted of taking part in a bombing at a preparedness parade. Uh, I guess my point here was this wasn't entirely a phantom. There were anarchists in the country bombing and killing people. Oh, yeah. And there was an attempt to kill the uh, attorney general, A. A. Mitchell Palmer, uh, in 1919. The bomber actually killed himself because the bomb went off prematurely. But this was right in the middle of Washington. That's right. Uh, Blew up in uh, uh, broad daylight. His house was just north of DuPont Circle. That's right. Where the then assistant secretary of the Navy guy named Franklin D. Roosevelt lived. So, yeah, we're establishing just the context of the times here. Debs, uh, this very long speech, he mentions other people who had been persecuted by the government for simply speaking out. He does romanticize the Bolsheviks a little bit, but as you say, he turned against them later. They were not the defenders of democracy, as he claimed they were for toppling the czars, uh, although the czars weren't very nice people either. They were autocrats and brought their country to ruin. So there were uh, federal agents in this very large crowd in Canton, Ohio on that day in 1918. Why did President Harding commute Debs' sentence in 1921? Well, actually, there was a pretty large movement after the war ended to commute the sentences of people like Debs who had uh, gone to jail under the Espionage Act, which actually the, the original act, the Sedition Act was passed a year later, it made it even tougher. But there was a cross-section of some Democrats and Republicans uh, supported commuting Debs' sentence and those of others. And also the war was over, and of course he'd been put in jail uh, in a law passed by Democrats and signed by Democratic President Woodrow Wilson. And Harding had won a landslide against the Democrats in 1920. So it was a way for Harding to sort of uh, you know, hand out an olive branch, I think, mm -hmm. to people to his left. And it was clear that in 1921, the war was long over by yeah. then. Debs was no threat, uh, even if it had been a threat before, as you say, which I very much doubt. He certainly wasn't a threat anymore. There was no draft to oppose anymore. The Espionage Act was still in the books, but the uh, more draconian amendments to it passed a year later were not in the books anymore. So it was a, a way to sort of get the country back to what Harding called normalcy. And I'm such a great interviewer, Michael Kazin, that I skipped something that I really, the reason I wanted to have you on here to begin with. How did he campaign from prison? But also, why did the Socialist Party not find a different candidate who could actually, you know, move around the country and campaign for the office? Well, most candidates back then uh, did not actually spend that much time campaigning for themselves. The campaigns were usually run more by surrogates. Uh, it was a rare figure like William Jennings Bryan and Theodore Roosevelt, who loved to go all over the country campaigning. So he did what a lot of candidates actually did uh, who were out of jail. He, he wrote speeches. They were delivered by other people. Uh, there were a lot of rallies on his behalf in which spoke, people spoke on his behalf. But obviously, it was, it was clear he was not going to win the election. <laughs> Nobody uh, had any illusions. Sorry. One of the reasons he did as well as he did, I think, he got about 3.5% mm, of the vote, about a million votes, is that he was a symbol of the repression, which by 1920, a lot of Americans, even many non-socialists, opposed. So to vote for Debs, again, an election which people knew was not going to be close, the Republicans were going to win it overwhelmingly, was a kind of protest vote against what Wilson and Congress had done during the war. And Debs was such an important symbol of the repression and was the charismatic leader of the Socialist Party, had been for so long and had run for president for the times that he was by far the best candidate they could have run. Nobody else would have gotten as many votes from non-socialists as Debs did. Yeah, he was a socialist, lowercase s, and a socialist, capital S. He was the head of the Socialist Party 
of America. Tom Doherty, a historian, wrote an article uh, that I shared with you about what was called the Front Cell Campaign. So Warren Harding ran what was called the Front Porch Campaign, accepted visitors to the front porch of his home in Marion, Ohio. So after Debs is uh, thrown in the slammer, they called it the Front Cell Campaign. According to Darty here, on May 29, 1920, in a carefully choreographed event, newsreel cameras filmed the delegation from the Socialist Party arriving at the Atlanta Penitentiary. Oh, yeah, I forgot, I forgot that. I yeah, forgot to that. inform it's, Debs it's, officially it's, it's, that he'd been nominated. And uh, so <laughs> I guess, you know, they didn't use radio as much in those days, broadcast radio. This is only 1920. So they did this, this movie. That's pretty, you know, modern touch. Uh, of course, it was a silent movie, so <laughs> That's right. it didn't have, it didn't have quite the impact of hearing Debs speak. And by the way, Debs was an amazing speaker, everyone says. I mean, there's, unfortunately, people have looked far and wide for any kind of recording of his speeches, and no one's ever found one that I know of, which is very sad because he was one of the great orators of his day, which is why he, of course, became the leader of the Socialist Party. That was so crucial to being a, a leader of, in most cases, of, especially of a radical party back then. All we have is people talking about how much they love to hear him speak, and far more people heard him speak and applauded him than ever voted for him. You know, I I always put audio in my podcast. I do montages of political leaders or whoever. You are right. There are no recordings of Debs. However, an actor named Leonard Spencer uh, reenacted a Debs speech. He's very, very uh, dramatic, is the actor Leonard Spencer. (laughs) Uh, I hate to interrupt you. You're the host here, but Bruni Sanders made a long documentary about Debs in which he recites some of Debs' speeches. And it's kind of hilarious to hear Bernie in his thick Brooklyn accent <laughs> uh, reciting, you know, Debs, who who was from Indiana, central Indiana, Terre Haute, Indiana, who did not speak any way that Bernie speaks. You might want to play a clip of that as well. But in all the history of the world, you, the people, have never had a voice in declaring war. And strange as it certainly appears, no war by any nation in any age has ever been declared by the people. Speaking of that actor, Leonard Spencer, fellow workers and comrades, the socialist movement is as wide as the world and its mission is to win the world, the whole world, from animalism. Animalism and consecrated to humanity for the tremendous task and for the royal privilege to share... But the reality here is... Professor Kazin, that the crackdown on leftists during World War I, that Debs and his movement, the Socialist Party, the Socialist Press, they never recovered, really. No, that's true. They could, a little bit in the Great Depression, 1932, Norman Thomas, who was then the leader of the Socialist Party, he gets, I uh, forget what percent of the vote, but it's a higher percentage than they had since, since Debs had run in 1920. But the Communist Party, actually, which was formed out of the Socialist Party in 1919, becomes a more important force in social movements in the 1930s, uh, in the labor movement, in the African-American movement. So, yeah, the socialists get supplanted by the Communist Party. The Communist Party falls apart. And then really since since then, since the 1940s, we haven't had a major uh, socialist party of any kind, even a a very large minor socialist party of any kind. Yet... We're so afraid of socialism. I mean, there's a that's a paradox. Is that the right word? So how popular were Debs's socialist ideas? Because, you know, he did oppose the war as a socialist, but, you know, he had an economic outlook. And I'm wondering, you know, just how much traction these ideas had in the United States at the time versus opposition to socialist ideas, because people were afraid, especially after the Bolshevik Revolution, of communism and socialism. That's a great, it's a great question. Folks should know that around the world, especially in Europe, but to a certain degree in Latin America and in Asia as well, socialism was quite popular. And uh, there were major socialist parties. The Polska Revolution was the only socialist revolution, but the major party in Germany before the war, World War I, also afterwards for a while, was the Socialist Democratic Party. The Labour Party was very big in Britain, which was basically a socialist party, et cetera, et cetera. So American Socialist Party was unusual in an industrial size, the fact that American Socialism was not very large a force, comparatively. But a lot of the ideas, the specific ideas, the kind of reforms which socialists wanted to institute were pretty popular. They wanted a more progressive income tax. They wanted nationalization of the railroads uh, and the telephone and the telegraph. They wanted to do away with the electoral college and have presidents elected by popular vote. Ever hear that? Uh, radical idea. Um, <laughs> they also wanted you know, every worker to have a, a real opportunity to join a union without being punished for trying to join a union. This is before the National Labor Relations Act, which put that into law. 
that got government protection, but that didn't exist yeah. in the early 20th century. So in other words, they were very much a part of what historians call the progressive era, very much a part of a time when there was a real antagonism by a lot of Americans, whether socialists or not, towards the power of big capital, towards the power of the banks, towards what was often seen as corruption, corrupt influence of uh, the very rich and those who ran big corporations over American politics. Uh, and so to the extent that the socialists were popular, they were popular partly because people liked some of the reform ideas and they liked the idea of somebody going full out and saying the only way to fix the corruption that big money has over American politics is to do away with big money altogether. Most Americans didn't go that far, but they kind of a lot of people kind of like somebody who was speaking in revivalistic terms about really having society run by ordinary people, for ordinary people, uh, rather than society that was controlled by big capital. I hear echoes of those ideas today. Debs was 65 in 1920, so he's near the end of his life. He died in 1926. You know, he goes back to the 19th century. He was born before the Civil War started, and he served in the legislature in Indiana, the state legislature in 1885. Uh, he was a city clerk in Terre Haute, Indiana before that. Uh, but he really gets going as a union man. Uh, in 1875, he helped organize a local lodge of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen. And he begins to advocate for the organization of labor unions, but by industry rather than by craft. And I am citing an encyclopedia article here as I talk to you, Professor Kazin. I did not have time to read an entire biography of Eugene Debs before interviewing you. So what was the significance of his approach to union organizing? You know, again, by industry rather than craft. Right. Well, he began, as you mentioned, as a very much a craft unionist. For the locomotive firemen was only for locomotive firemen who were an essential part of the running of, uh, of trains. There were a bunch of strikes in which uh, the different craft unions, they were called the Railroad Brotherhoods on the railroads, opposed one another sometimes. And the large majority of railroad workers who were not in the railroad crafts but built and repaired tracks, or worked in machine shops, that kind of thing, were not part of the Railroad Brotherhoods. And so he began to think that it was really necessary in order to have real power of workers on the railroads to have one big union of railroad workers. And so uh, he and some other brothers from the Railroad Brotherhoods broke away from the old craft unions and formed a union called the American Railway Union in uh, 1893. And this was an unusual thing at the time. There were very few unions based on industry as opposed to craft at that time. There were the brewery workers, the United Mine Workers, but generally uh, most unions were, were focused on skilled craftsmen and almost entirely men as well. And this was a huge success at first. About six months after the uh, ARU was organized, they had half of all the union members in America were members of their union. Wow. And there was overlap with the populists of uh, this time as well. Unlike the phony populists of today, the populists back then believed that uh, powerful economic interests were making it harder for ordinary people to live fulfilling lives or, or realize their dreams economically. And the powerful interest of that day was... The railroads, or were the railroads, and Debs did a successful strike against the Great Northern Railway for higher wages in 1894. But then he gets in trouble uh, leading a different strike against the Chicago Pullman Palace Car Company. And uh, that's when he makes his conversion, right? In jail, he's reading the work of Marx and others. Why don't you pick it up from there? Yeah, sure. Well, well very quickly, the ARU made a big mistake. That is, they, they decided to support a strike by men and women who were making the Pullman cars, the sleeping and dining cars, which used to be on every railroad train uh, in America, at least those who went for long distances. They uh, boycotted, railroad workers uh, boycotted the trains that carried Pullman cars. Only problem with that, those same trains carried mail. And, Oops. <laughs> and so that gave the federal government under President Grover Cleveland an excuse to take out an injunction against them and to send in the U.S. Army to break the strike and to put Dubs in jail, you know, for uh, disobeying the injunction, telling him to stop the strike. So he goes to jail, rather, rather large living room style cell, actually, in Woodstock, Illinois. And there he's a, a famous guy. He's a celebrated figure. He lost his strike, but he's still a hero to a lot of working people. He reads a lot of Marx. He reads a lot of uh, Marxists of various kinds. And he gets visits from leading socialists at the time, 
people like Victor Berger, who was a leading socialist from Wisconsin. And when he emerges from jail, first he supports William James Bryan for president in 1896. But after that, that's over, then he says, I'm a socialist. And uh, he goes on to lead a precursor to the Socialist Party. And then when the Socialist Party is formed in 1901, he's the unrivaled leader of the Socialist Party. Yeah, he saw the Republicans and Democrats at this point as basically being the same. Yeah, he basically said, look, they're going to be under the rule of capital at all times. There's no way to break that. The only way to break that is to give the working class its own party. And that's, again, he was just following the footsteps of what was going on in Europe. And Debs ran for president a number of times. We've been talking about 1920. He did pretty well in 1912 as well, which is a really interesting election because the Republican ticket was split or the Republican vote truly was split. And and you would know better than I, but Woodrow Wilson only becomes president because Teddy Roosevelt runs as a third party candidate after he was denied the Republican nomination. Right. And Debs wins 6 percent of the vote. He actually wins a much higher percent in 19. 12, they didn't in 1920 because women could vote in 1920 and they couldn't vote in 1912. So pretty much the same number of raw votes, but percentage was much higher in 1912 because only men were voting. Yeah, not bad for a socialist, I guess, in the United States. Or, he wins uh, He wins 16 percent in Oklahoma, of all places, which uh, now is one of the reddest states in the country. And, <laughs> and since red was originally the color of, of socialism, you could say it was one of the redder states of the country in 1912 as well. Uh, <laughs> he wins a high percentage in Nevada. For example, too, which is hardly any people were living there at the time, but you know there was a lot of support for him, and and so he gets a lot of support from people who had been populists, I think, at least radical populists, and that explains some of his popularity among small farmers in places like uh, Oklahoma, and also there were a lot of coal miners there and other. Yeah other uh, wage earners there as well. Yeah, I don't often think about the connection of red to uh, communism uh, (laughs) when we talk about red states today. And also the Nazis adopted red as well in in their flag because uh, I guess they were impressed, Hitler was, with how socialists organized and their banners and the color red was not to digress about that. I mean, there's a lot of digressions here. We could go on and on about the causes of World War I uh, versus how Deb saw it. But, you know, I, I told you I would only keep you for about a half hour or so, so... We could do a 25-part series on these other. (laughs) Well, I mentioned uh, Debs, uh, the socialist. He does this conversion to socialism in the late 1890s. When I think of the history of labor unions in the United States, most of them, or many of them, wanted to reform capitalism and make it better, not overthrow capitalism and take over the companies, but rather allow management to still be management, but have a better deal for themselves. Did Debs want to overthrow capitalism? Oh, very much so. That is, when he became a socialist, he did. Before then, he did not. What's interesting about it is that he actually, after the American Railway Union falls apart, after this disastrous strike and boycott against the Pullman cars in 1894, he never again really spends that much energy on unions. He does support a very radical union federation called the Industrial Workers of the World that's formed in 1905. But he didn't spend much time on it. He's really much more focused on building up his party, a political party. There's a division among socialists, actually, about whether to work with this revolutionary union, the IWW, or to stay in the uh, the older uh, organization, mostly of craft unions, the American Federation of Labor, the FFL, run by Samuel Gompers, who was very much anti-socialist. Most socialists actually disagree with Debs. They stay in the FFL, not because they agree with Gompers, but because they believe the FFL is where most Union workers are, and they want to make sure they're not irrelevant to the union movement, uh, which they thought they would be if they joined the much smaller IWW. But uh, no, he's very much, I mean, to be a socialist was to be in favor of the overthrow of capitalism. And Debs believed it was inevitable. I mean, that's what a lot of socialists, you know, it's strange to, I tell my students, I teach a course on socialism, tell my students to imagine a time when if you're a socialist, you didn't just believe it was a good thing to overthrow capitalism. You believed it was inevitable. Capitalism was going to fall. That's how they they interpreted Marx's writings. And so in that way, he was like a, a Christian who believes whether or not you believe in, in Christ, second coming is on, on its way. It just might take a while, but we'll get there. <laughs> well, Marx subscribed to a stage theory of history, as did Adam Smith. Matter of fact, I think Marx got that from Smith. Several stages on the road to communism, a utopia. Socialism was one of them. But Marx believed that uh, you had to have capitalism first. You had to have prosperity in a successful capitalist system. And that is when the workers would realize that they're being, they could do better than the, the that they already had and throw off their chains, right? 
Yeah, and also Marx believed that capitalism would inevitably fail. Yes, there'd sir. be a falling rate of profit, there'd be higher concentrations of capital, and so small businessmen would, would fall out, and eventually uh, workers would not have enough money to buy the products that these more concentrated industries were dependent on, and so the whole system would eventually fall. And that's what Debs was basing his prediction on. Thank you for uh, helping me through my Marx there. Uh, I'm not a Marxist intellectual, so... <laughs> I'm not a Marxist either, but I teach Mar- I teach about Marxism, so... Not anymore, Professor Gaze. No, just kidding. Now, we'll wrap up with, uh, you know, who are the Debs of today? Uh, we did a show a couple of years ago already. What happened to the anti-war left? Debs, of course, opposed war as a socialist, as I mentioned. Workers of different countries are not supposed to kill each other. Bernie Sanders comes to mind as a kind of socialist. You know, what's funny is that people on the right in the United States today call Democrats socialists all the time. But people on the left say mainstream Democrats have sold their souls to Silicon Valley and and others. I don't know. I don't really see a Debs today. Well, no, there's not, in part because Debs was, after all, a radical or even revolutionary socialist. He really wanted to do do away with capitalism altogether and thought eventually there'd be some sort of probably violent revolution in the United States uh, unless the Socialist Party could win overwhelming victory in, in election. And there aren't many people like that today. There's some, but they're usually in very small little Marxist sects of various kinds. There is an organization, as many listeners probably know, a Democratic Socialists of America, which was formed in part by people from the old Socialist Party, like Michael Harrington back in the early 1980s. Uh, it has some troubles now, but it it's, has about 90,000 members and far, far more than it did before Bernie Sanders began to run for president. And Bernie himself is a great admirer of Debs. Uh, he made a film about Debs. He says that he has a picture of Debs, I think, on the wall in his Senate office. But uh, Sanders is best defined as what Europeans would call a social democrat. That is, yeah. he believes in reforming American capitalism, uh, so it's a more egalitarian system, but not doing away with private property, not doing away with private ownership of the means of production. Yeah. He's given speeches about socialism at my university, Georgetown, and other places in the past where he says, if socialism is dangerous, then then you should disagree with Social Security, yeah. disagree with the income tax, disagree with Medicare, all these things Americans basically like. Yeah. Well, not the income tax, maybe, but so the Social Security, uh, Medicare, and unions, strong unions, all these things. And that's what I think socialism is. He doesn't talk about overthrowing capitalism anymore. Yeah. Social Security, which all of you know, transform life for senior citizens in this country, was defined by his opponents as socialists. The concept of the minimum wage, that workers had to be paid at least a certain amount of money for their labor, was seen as a radical intrusion into the marketplace and was described as socialist. Unemployment insurance, when you lose your job, you have something to fall back upon. Abolishing child labor, Ending the fact that children of 8, 10, 12 years of age were working in factories or working in the fields. The 40-hour work week, collective bargaining, the rights of workers to engage in negotiations with a union. Strong banking regulations, deposit insurance, and job programs that put millions of people to work were all described in one way or another as socialist. Now, he's not a doctrinaire Marxist. Uh, the European socialist parties have abandoned Marxism a long time ago. They have accepted the global marketplace. They just, as you say, want a better deal for ordinary workers within a capitalist system. And I think those are the ideas that we hear today. Those are where the echoes are, you know, especially during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic where the billionaire class did very well and uh, workers are still struggling to get what? Universal health care, paid family leave, you know, other types of insurance, if you will, against the vicissitudes of living in a capitalist society. How'd you like that And that, that goes one? back to Debs' first yeah. you know, passion, which was, which was unionism. You know, countries that have much stronger unions tend to have much more egalitarian political systems as well. Like in Finland, I think 90% of all workers in Finland are members of unions, something like that. And and Finland, you know, has different views on different issues, uh, but no one has to worry about 
about going bankrupt uh, when they get sick in Finland. No one, has, no one has to worry. Very few people have to yes. worry about not being able to find a decent place to live and so forth. Yeah, I have a friend who lives in Finland now and he loves it. Anyway, you know, I've uh, been a member of unions as we wrap up here, Michael Kazin. Reminds me of a joke Lou Costello told in a movie of his. You know, somebody was barking orders at him and Costello said, I'm a union man. I only work 16 hours a day. And this guy, <laughs> and this guy says to him, what do you mean? Union men work eight hours a day. And Costello said, I belong to two unions. <laughs> That's a great joke. I never heard that. There's an old saw, which I tell in my class uh, all the time when I mention Debs, that if you're not a socialist when you're 20, you have no heart. If you are still a socialist when you're 40, you have no brain. Well, in fact, Debs was not a socialist at 20. He doesn't become a socialist until his 40s. So in other words, he reverses that uh, famous or infamous dictum. And the truth is, and again, this is a truth we must put on the table. Yes, we are better off today economically than we were seven years ago when Bush left office. But the other truth is that for the last 40 years, 40 years on the Republican leadership and Democratic leadership, the great middle class of our country has been in decline and faith in our political system is now extremely low. And in upcoming episodes of History As It Happens, we're going to cover the issue of age in presidential races. We'll speak to historian Lindsay Chervinsky. We're also going to take a look at the legacy of Yasser Arafat, who died 20 years ago, 2004, as the war in Gaza rages on. What about Arafat's vision for his people? Will it ever be realized? What was it to begin with? Is it something that's even realistic at this point? And we'll also revisit the issue of whether the U.S. empire is in decline. Wait, the U.S. has an empire? That and more coming up as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. <laughs>